Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun podcast. I am your host, Dave Wakeman. Today's episode is brought to you by my good friends at Booking Protect, the global leaders in refund protection. Any listing, any sector, anywhere, Booking Protect has you covered with the world's most comprehensive refund protection product. To find out how you and your organization can partner with Booking Protect to deliver world-class customer service, a better, more customized buying experience, and how you and your organization can create a new stream of revenue, visit them at www.bookingprotect.com. Again, that web address is www.bookingprotect.com. Are we going to see you at the Intix 2020 conference in New York City from January 20th to 23rd? If you listened to the last episode with Danny Frank, you know it's going to be the biggest and best Intix ever. And I'm not saying that just because I have a New York City bias, which I do. Get your tickets by visiting Intix.org. My mug is on the front page of that thing. Um, You're going to be able to see presentations from me. Simon Mab, you'll be able to run into Intix board member Cat Spencer. There's tons and tons of great conversations, great content, uh, great networking, great connections, great everything at Intix in New York. So Intix.org. Also, do you get my new newsletter that my team puts together called Talking Tickets? You go to my website, DaveWakeman.com, click on the link to get Talking Tickets. It's five stories from the week that was with a short analysis from me about why the story matters, what to pay attention to, how you can take advantage of it, all kinds of stuff like that. As an added bonus, Kat and Simon have contributed a registration to Intix and a um, trade show pass to subscribers. I'm going to give it away on January, maybe the 3rd or the 10th. Uh, I haven't decided yet, but first or second Friday of January, I'm going to give it away. Um, one pass, one registration, one pass to the trade show for all new and old people who sign up for talking tickets. You get that by going to my website and clicking on the talking tickets link, right? And if you get some of your colleagues to sign up, I'm going to give you an extra entry or something of that sort to give you a little bit of advantage for spreading the love about talking tickets. So do that now. My guest today is a guy by the name of Greg Turner. Greg is from China. China. And this was really, 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 really great. Um, I look at Greg as like somebody who has opened my eyes to how things go and how best to understand the Chinese market. Um, We talked a lot about the nature of doing business in China. We talked about the mindset that we need to take if we're coming from the Western world going to China. We talked about um, where there are opportunities in China. We talked about, um, you know, the size of the market, the technology of it, the politics of the market. We talked about some about the NBA, the NHL, the AFL. Uh, We talked about David Stern. We talked about uh, Beijing and Hong Kong. We talked about um, management. We talked about... um, you know, people going to China for a money grab. I mean, we had a really good conversation. I am excited for all of you to hear this talk. Um, I really think Greg's a great guy, and he really has made me a lot smarter about China. Um, We don't have it announced yet, but um, I think that we are going to do a workshop or a couple things in China in the new year. Um, So, And I wanted to be able to share Greg um, his ideas, his point of view, his thoughts with you, before we do any of that stuff, and it, you know, this is really, really a great chance for people to learn from Greg, um, and you know, find out what China really, really, really is about. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I've learned about the, the Chinese market by talking to Greg. So, without anything else from me, here's my conversation with Greg Turner on the Business of Fun podcast. I want to welcome Greg Turner to the Business of Fun podcast. Greg, how's it going, man? Uh, excellent. Very good. Yeah, good. Very good. Good. I know it's uh, late in, in uh, Shenzhen. Shenzhen. Sh- yeah. yeah. Uh, so thank you for doing this. It's early for me. That's fine. Um, now, m- many people may not have heard of you, but you are my resident go-to uh, expert on all things China. Uh, can you give everybody a little bit of a background of, about your background? Because I think it's like pretty interesting, and it will frame the conversation we're going to have. 
Sure, sure. So I've been over here in China for 20 years. I'm a Canadian, moved over here in 2000, and I've been basically going from the very far north part of the country where I first lived in a city called Harbin to Beijing to Shanghai where I lived for 12 years. And then I moved on to a city called Shanto for five, and now I live in Shenzhen here. So altogether 20 years, slowly moving my way down the coast. Uh, I call myself a Canadian who's running away from winter, uh, and I've pretty much reached as far south as I can in China without what as I can. Um, my experience it covers a lot on um, events and venue management. Uh, in Shanghai, I kind of split my time between a few different venues and then also with some different events. Um, for example, I ran uh, Jiangwan Sports Center, turning it in from a government-run facility into a private-run facility back in 2007. And then uh, I worked three years on the Shanghai Rugby Sevens, which was part of the Asian Rugby Sevens series, setting that up and getting it moving. And uh, most recently, I did a project called the uh, Shanto University Sports Park, working for the Li Ka-Shing Foundation. And I was just brought in to oversee construction and then kind of uh, put together a business plan and an operating plan that then um, that we then uh, turned into uh, operating for a couple of years before I moved on and to where I'm at now. <laughs> yep. Yep. And can you tell us a little bit about so what you're now, up to? So now, I mean, because with all my I experience mean, we, we and like everything I've been doing in China for so long, too, I, had just um, in the Hong Kong I think there's a real the need for flying the sharing Tokyo that experience. Flying the um, so I'm just kind of uh, so trying to, to help those companies or those people that are interested in doing business business in China and events and venues that maybe haven't reached the levels of success they want to, to try and understand what how they can do it better, where they can improve and uh, and uh, get better results. Yeah, and I think, um, the, you know, one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons to have you on the podcast today, but one of the reasons that it was really interesting to me is because, like I was joking about at the start, it's like you're kind of my the person I turn to when I have questions about China. And, you know, over the last couple of months, there's been a couple of really big stories that have gone on. And when we were talking about them privately, uh, you know, there was a couple of insights that you made that I thought were probably missed by people in the West a little bit just because there is a um, – the Chinese market's unique in the way that they deal with things compared to the way we might in Western countries. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, kind of the nature of the market of China. Uh, and you made an observation to me that I said, oh, man, I never even thought about it this way before about how in the states, right, when we use the states as an example or Canada, the government's there to support the private sector. And in China – the private sector is there to support the government, and it's an entirely 180 degree. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, th this is a point that I think a lot of people miss about China. They come in here, they see the size of the market, market, they see all these people, and they think all they have to do is sell. The business but once they move right in there. and they start dealing with some of the hurdles that come up here, they just don't understand it because there's a, a, a gap in, the, in what they expect versus the reality. Um, you know, China is – it's got its ups and downs. It's got its problems. It's got its benefits. Uh, but what's happened here in the past 30 years, bringing what 800 million people out of poverty, it's unbelievable. And, and that's mainly because of the plans that the government puts in place for good or for bad. Um, so, you know, that whole idea that here the businesses work for the government um, is a big part of the reason why that's happened. And for a Western company to come in and not grasp that they're going to lose almost every battle they have with a local competitor um, just because they don't understand what the government's priorities are. They don't understand what the rules are. They're almost playing by a different set of rules. It's like going out to play basketball and you're, and you're a hockey player. You just understand how to play hockey. You just, you won't, you aren't going to win the game. You don't know the rules. So understanding where, what the government policy is, it's, you know, there's a central government policy that they release every five years called the five year plan. And then they build on that regularly with what they call guiding opinions and unless you understand what all of that is and develop a strategy or a plan that connects what you're doing with what they want, it's going to be really difficult to, to succeed in the, in the long run. Um, so that, I think that's one key thing that a lot of people miss here.
Yeah, and it's really interesting to me because it sounds very easy to say that, hey, look, you know, it's just you have to go, hey, the government is not there to support the business, the business is there to support the government. But it plays out entirely differently. Um, and that's what's been interesting to me because I think like we saw recently uh, with the NBA, you know, the, what's completely appropriate for somebody from the NBA to say Right, when we're talking about Daryl Morey making comments about the uh, protests in Hong Kong, is completely inappropriate for a chap. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's um, there's there's a that whole NBA thing. It's really quite a shame because out of all the organizations that I know of that have moved into China, um, what the NBA has done here has been the most successful. Um, the NBA China pro- company that they have here has understands how it works and and they get it. Um, but it just shows how quickly things can turn. If you don't have control over your messaging and, and your, the people in your organization don't understand what the real, how things really work. Um, is there anything wrong with what he said? I don't think so. But part of it was the reaction of the NBA itself, um, really kind of amplified the problem. Um, and it's, uh, it's a difficult situation for the NBA for sure because all the hard work they put in the past 20 years is who knows what's going to be happening there. Um, so challenging for sure. Yeah. And what's inter- mm-hmm. what's interesting is that you take this NBA situation and then I was asking you the other day yeah. about, you know, what impact would um what I guess we, we, we call in the West a trade war would have yeah. on the relationships between the United States and China. And you said it would have actually very little because it's just sort of the, um, the way that the Chinese do business is that they kind of expect these things to go on. It's just the, the way that they operate. And, you know, you, I think you, and you tell me if I'm wrong, you described it as a situation where they almost approach it like going, well, why haven't you done this before a little bit? And, but you said that the big challenge would be, and this is what plays into the NBA thing is now that the U S government has kind of uh, passed legislation to, uh, and I'm not sure exactly the wording because, um, as I said before, yeah. I try to not pay as, pay as little attention. To Absolutely. I mean, now as possible because it's such like, a, again, it kind of goes back to the whole thing. discussion um, about the difference the, between the way government and business relations than talk to each other between stuff. the U S and China Can you explain in, that in a bit to us? the U S business and politics. There's a lot of mingling going on there on all levels in China. Um, they try and keep the politics on a separate conversation than the business. Even though there is still the same amount of mingling, you don't say it as openly. Um, and so by by the trade war, I think I read this somewhere and it really made an impact on me because it really makes sense to me. This trade war thing, China's been basically for the past 20 years, China's been uh, winning a war without fighting it. And the U.S. has been losing a war, has been fighting a war without winning it. And so now they're starting to change the situation And China. I believe they would understand why. Um, but now that the U.S. has passed this legislation, first about Hong Kong and now also something about Xinjiang, um, that kind of changes it from a business discussion into a political discussion. And it is also an integr like a China is very proud of its history and its culture and everything. And the challenge be an outside force coming in to challenge the country and saying, hey, we are, we're going to take a stand on Hong Kong and we're going to take a stand on Xinjiang. It's going to piss off some people in the in the um central government and make it a lot diff- more difficult for the long term resolving these things. And, you know, for the, just going back to the NBA issue, I think that this again shows just one, one tweet just blew up the NBA's business in China, whatever it was, $4 billion or whatever it was, just gone in a minute. It's, uh, it used to be every game on, on 10 cents and regular games on CCTV and now they're down to three or four games a week on 10 cent, nothing on CCTV and all their local partners have pulled out support. So. On what based on one tweet? Yeah, I mean it, it, that's pretty amazing to consider. Uh, and now another interesting thing that we've talked about in the past is we talked about the nature of sport in China, which I think is one thing that's also interesting to talk about as well, because, you know, you said you grew up in hockey and I talked about how I grew up around baseball and American football and basketball. And you were telling me how 
this new um, fascination and this attention that's given to sport in China is unique because for the most part, kids don't grow up like that with a, with a, um, sure. Um, you know, kind of, a you know, uh, like love of China's very like strong on school. Teams um, I just saw a news report today um, that said China's got the best students in the world, whatever that means. Probably don't understand um, that either. so there's a lot, a lot of pressure on these kids to study a lot and they just don't have the same access to PE classes and to extracurricular sports that in the West we all grow up with. And we don't even, you know, we, we play as sports every day. Um, so they don't have that from the beginning. They don't have that connection to these sports that they get exposed to later on in life. Um, and so as a sports league coming in or whatever it is, you're dealing with people that might have some interest in the sport, but they don't have any personal connection to it. Um, so there's a big question on how do you change, how do you change that approach? How do you develop that? Um, right now, the central government, um, there's one picture from about 2013 or 2014, and Xi Jinping was in, the president of China was in the UK, and he was out on a, inspecting some football stadium in the UK, and he, they took a picture of him kicking a football. And uh, I, have a, I gave a presentation a few months ago on, on China sports, and um, this picture to me represented, it's not just Xi Jinping kicking a football, it's actually him kicking open the door to the development of Chinese sports. And since then, uh, the government's come out with some, some different documents and some different policy opinions on uh, how they're going to develop the sport, what kind of work they're going to put into it, and, and where they want it to go. And, you know, every month they're re issuing more and more detailed um, policy opinions on this stuff. And just to give some numbers, for example, by 2025, um, the government wants the size of the Chinese sports Performance markets, so competitions, events, that kind of stuff, to be two trillion RMB. And if you work that out to rem to U.S. dollars, that's about divided by say seven, that's about three hundred billion dollars a year annual annual revenue for this industry. One hundred large scale events, so that's international events, of different kinds of different kinds of sports and stuff. And then also one hundred unique event sports brands, as they call it. So whether that's uh, the events themselves or players or uh, athletic brands or whatever, uh, apparel brands or whatever. They want to have a 100 unique event sports brands. So, there's, I mean, this is how they work. They, they put these great big numbers on it as a central government piece. And then regional governments then take those numbers and, and try to put together a plan on how they're going to contribute to the development of that. And then, say, a city would then take what their regional or provincial government put together, and they'll put together their own plan. And then they issue, the, issue that out to the public. And so all of this stuff is published. Local companies get it. They understand it. They figure out how they're going to help support it. And then when they go in and they talk to the government about picking up some sort of uh, policy or permit approval or some sort of uh, funding support or something like that, they have this story where they can say, well, this is the gov this is the policy from the central government. This is the policy from the local city. This is what I'm doing to help support all of that. And this is why you helping me will help you get better results. And unless you can say that kind of stuff with what you're doing, it makes it a lot more difficult to get results. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and when you talk about it in the terms of the, the central yeah. government sets a huge goal, right? On the surface... You, you know, take all the political things. That's great because I think that's what a lot of organizations are missing is like they just don't have a big target because, you know, recently when I went to Sydney, I talked about putting a man on the moon. I go, it could have been an, it was at the time it was an impossible goal, right? It, and then by setting these big goals, right? It, it, it kind of coalesces all of your attention around something bigger. And I think, this yeah, is they're, why they're we're trying to get to 2030. I think they're trying to get involved in 2030. Sports. Market. And, um, you know, I think what it, what it was one of the big goals they said they want to, um, win the World Cup. What was it? Is it maybe that's yeah. 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 So it was like a really huge goal to be, be involved in the World Cup, right? And it's, you know, all these huge things because without them, you don't get anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it also, the way you explained it, it helps people understand like how they can put themselves in a position to, um, you know, partner with the Chinese government to bring sport to 
to the Chinese population. One example I think that, and I, uh, I talked about this before, is the Australian Football League. And, you know, my, fr- they're my friends there now, um, I know a lot of them. Uh, they've been very success, or mm-hmm. they've been probably more successful than a lot of organizations because they do actually take that kind of point of view. They understand that one of the big gaps, um, mm-hmm. is, introducing sport to the population and they look at it as like a kind of a cultural exchange between Australia and China and as a way to like further the love of sport. And I think that's a pretty successful um, approach from what I've learned from you. <clears throat> if you were, to, let's say, and we'll use an example. Um, well, I guess like, you know, we'll look at the premier league or some of the European soccer clubs who, that are, um, you know, cause I know that like Juventus has an office in, Hong Kong, I think Man U has a, an office there. Uh, Tottenham Hotspur, which I have the the top on right now, of you know they have a huge presence in Hong Kong. Um, you know, and all over China, there's a lot of uh, European oh. football clubs. You know, what are they doing right? You know, right. as far as I think that the, the European football is a really interesting case because well, first of all, there's so uh, many different leagues and teams, and all of them seem to have a different strategy. Uh, for some of these organizations so that take are, that versus you know, the NBA, which is very much one organization pushing something forward. So you can, within what European football does, you can see a lot of different strategies and results and, and everything else, which can help to understand the market better. I think when the, say, look back 10, 15 years, um, there was a real feeling in China that they were excited that these teams were starting to come over. Um, but at that time, the Chinese quickly realized that these teams were just coming over for a money grab um, and weren't really investing into the local community. Um, and I think that there was a bit of a blowback for a bit um, on on the results that the teams were getting or, they were, or that what they were trying to do was getting. And now you're starting to see more and more teams that are investing into local youth development and, and uh, you know, trying to support some local some local organizations, maybe buy a second tier or a third tier Chinese team and put some resources in to try and support it. And all of that stuff is, is really heading in the right direction. Um I think that uh, one of the things that you could learn that they could maybe learn more from the NBA is uh, how do they unite their message? So it's not so confusing to, to a fan that this is all one football league. This is all one football team. I think that the, 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 there's a lot of passion now for European football within younger Chinese people. And if they want to know about it, they can figure it out. But it's not necessarily something they catch, they catch quickly. So there's probably a little bit of messaging in there they could do. It's a little bit better. But by taking on the youth sports and by taking on uh, support of some lower, lower level teams to try and develop their, um, their the professionalism is going to help out a lot, I think. Yeah, I mean that makes total sense. I uh, this uniting the message and telling a better story. This is almost a universal challenge for organizations because I feel that um, mm-hmm. where it doesn't matter what the market is, um, it doesn't matter what the sport is, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, the, the organizations and the leagues that are successful are telling a better story. Uh, marketing seems to be a either a core asset or a core. Um, detractor from almost every organization in the world, it seems at this point. And, and I think there's more in the latter category than yeah. there are in the former at this point. Um, the grassroots and focusing on the local sports, so that's interesting because one organization comes to mind that has done a really great job of that all over the world has been Man City and the way that they've created the city uh, football group. And they, ha- you know, they have invested in, in India, they, in Australia, in the U.S., in obviously in England, um, you know, and they're, and they're doing a great job. And, and I think that sort of has led to, um, some of their success because, you know, yes. and I'm thinking yeah. about the state specifically. I know that in Harlem, Man City has built football pitches so kids can experience soccer and they can train on like a nice, uh, training pitch. Yeah. And it, it's great. And I think that would be something that like, you know, I don't know, think it probably cost them nearly as much as they gain in benefit because, you know, it's another asset for their sponsors. It's a, like you said, it's developing local mm-hmm. sport in a grassroots way. Um, it's setting a really great message, a clear message. Um, you know, it, it does a lot of positive things, but, but I don't necessarily think that people are always thinking that way. Yeah. Um, 
and I think it's to their, their detriment because a lot of times if you get the kids early, right, it's easier. The, the earlier you get somebody, the, the I think I think so that I mean, if you're looking at the European sports cycle, right? um, the, or know, the European football, the even though earlier, they're putting some investment into developing the youth, they're still facing the challenge I mean, all these of getting those kids out, involved in their program um, for the long term. Yeah. Because they're, again, I'm just, I have to stress again that they're, these kids are under so much pressure in their school. Um, you know, starting from grade eight, they're already getting judged for which university they're going to be able to attend and their grades matter. Um, I remember when I was looking at universities, I didn't start thinking about it until I was in grade 11 and these kids are doing it in grade eight and there's so, just so much pressure on them. So how do you get them? So when they're very young, you can get them out to these programs, you can get them involved, but once university starts counting, their school really starts mattering starts to matter how do you uh how do you keep them involved that's a question that all these teams are going to have to face sooner or later yeah well i think probably one of the helpful uh, angles that people can take <laughs> too is right is we know education's so important right and you said grade 11 and to be honest, it's probably for me, it was probably grade 12. And I'm lucky that I went to as good of a school as I did, yep. <laughs> did because I was definitely not paying that much attention to it. Um, but I think maybe as an angle, right? Because part of what we've been talking about here is like, if you're trying to come to China and you want to do business in China, one of the more effective ways is to get involved and understand what the government want, the outcomes the government's trying to achieve. And yeah. it sounds to me, and you tell me, again, tell me if I'm wrong here, is that the government wants to, number one, increase, increase the, um, the athletic proficiency and the athletic uh, involvement of children. Number two is it wants to um, increase the education quality of its kids, right? It wants to make sure that it maintains that level of having the, the, the best students in the world, like you said, whatever that means, because I'm sure uh, anybody can, yeah. you know, measure that however they want to. And then the third thing is they, obviously, if they've raised 800 million people out of poverty over the last uh, couple decades, they want to continue to grow the economy. Uh, and, and putting that in, in understanding those three huge goals, you could say that, hey, look, as a Western organization, right? If you're a football club from England or you're a basketball team from the U.S., you can go, hey, yeah. look, here's all these positive impacts that you have, the kids have from playing sport and make that yeah. a part of the, the, the big question, I mean, pitch. that's, make that you're hitting your it pretty close here is that you've go got to be able to have that in your, in your pitch to the government and say, this is what we're do. doing. This um, is how we're facing your challenges like and how we're going to support successful. you. They don't care at all about how much money you're going to make or what challenges you're facing. They, they care about how are you going to help them with their challenges. And once they feel they can su support or they, they can rely on you and they can trust you to help them get results, that's when they're going to start actually caring about what you're doing. Um, if you're not helping them achieve their yeah. targets, they don't care about an international company. They don't care about anything because – they have so much going on already. They have so much local development that they have to take care of. They have so much, you know, the 800 million people out of poverty that didn't happen without a lot of hard work. And, uh, so they need to keep focused on what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually a really great lesson for any business, right? Because I think yeah. um, I was reading last night a book on sales and it was talking about like, you know, your, your yeah. sales <laughs> story and the way that like most people well, well, no, well, what they're is saying is me. it's all about right? me. But I'm, 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 I don't care what you're doing. It's all about me. Really I'm the Chinese really government. Want. It's all hey, about look, me. Whatever you so want, great, but saying. I don't care. They're just uh, which is really what most customers are saying anyway. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. But they're, they're just like, they, they have a bigger, you know, they have more influence so they can say it and it sticks. Right. I mean, there's like, Hey, look, I don't need you period. And like, if you don't pay attention, which I think is a great lesson for organizations to learn because yeah. a little bit, I think some of the Western organizations have gotten a little bit, um, uh, full of themselves where they think that like they're more important than they really are. Um, and you, you see these examples of so many stadiums and so many buildings or like with the NBA now, the um, ratings are down about 20 percent this year so yeah. far, um, you know, just assuming that uh, people need them. And I, I'm, you know, 
I love sport and entertainment, uh, obviously, as much as the next person. Nobody needs you. Yeah, yeah. That's the whole, and that's the challenge that a lot of us are facing. And um, that's what's interesting about dealing with the Chinese government is that yeah. they're willing to say it right there's to their a, faces. Like, there's a great story. You. So if you're not willing to. There's a great to story about David Stern in China. To, and uh, when uh, the NBA was first trying to start to move in. Then we don't and have um, he and was coming over here know, trying to meet with the head you know, of it, China Central Television, CCTV, who is a political appointee, I, I believe. Um, and. He was bringing game fit, game video, trying to get the games put onto the TV, and this guy didn't care at all to meet David Stern. And David Stern, I think he went three or four days sitting in the lobby of this guy's office, waiting to meet this guy on just as he was coming out of his door. This is the chair, this is the commissioner of the NBA, sitting outside this door for days, waiting for Magua Lee to come outside and and at least look at, at least talk to him, right? At least acknowledge that he was even in the building. Um, and so I, if David Stern's willing to make that sacrifice and come in and make put that time in, understanding that the commissioner of the NBA doesn't mean anything in China, I think every other organization that's trying to come into China has got to keep that story in mind because sooner or later you're going to run into a bureaucrat and that's what they're going to be. They're, they don't care about who you are, where you're coming from. They're just going to ignore you until you do something that helps them. <laughs> yeah. yeah right and it's um i mean i live in dc so i mean that's very <laughs> familiar to me uh the bureaucrats rule, rule the town rule the roost um <laughs> and it, it, it's self-interest right and but i yeah. think i mean again it's um we're talking specifically about China, but this is a lesson that I think people could learn just everywhere. It's like yeah. nobody cares about your solution, right? Nobody cares about what you want, right? It's just like how can you help the people that you're trying to serve, right, or that you want to serve or that you want to work with, right? Like what can you do that's going to make their life easier? Yeah. Th that's the most valuable lesson you can learn. And if you learn it easy or and earlier, that good. If you take a couple of times hitting your head against the wall, then, eh, you know, so be it. Um, you know, and, and that's what it, most of this conversation about China sounds like to me is that, like, in the West, right, we are, I guess, uh, especially the states, very aggressive, very bullheaded, um, and very much focused on just, like, doing the, yeah. doing the, doing the job, right? Like, it, like, banging through. A lot of times when you go out into the rest of the world, Everybody is a lot more focused on a relationship, which is what you're, you're, you're pointing out here. Um, self interest is, is both more pronounced, but also it, at least with, with the Chinese example, it's very evident what the self interest is. But you have to show people like why, you know, that's <laughs> maybe too lovely like, those sometimes. Are two too things kind. That I think we struggle with coming from America, especially. I, you know, I won't speak for the Chinese. Chinese, or not Chinese, the Canadians, the Canadians are mostly lovely people. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes a little, yeah, a little too kind. And, and I think that this is an important lesson that like we all need to learn, which is that like we have to be able to be empathetic to the audience we're trying to reach. And, you know, and that's probably like a big idea that I'll be pushing mm -hmm. all of uh, 2020 is, you know, empathy and that all strategy is marketing strategy. Um, but yeah. now, let's shift a little bit back to you and what you're focusing on here for a second. Um, because you've had a, you had a great opportunity. You, you, you just spoke in, uh, Hong Kong. You just spoke. Well, in I, th I think that, um, um you know, one of the things like that I'm really trying place. to stress to people, um, stress to people interested in China, China right now is that, um, outside of, they need to start looking like outside of Shanghai and Beijing. To do to be um, I think that those two markets is, 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 as as famous and as blown out and as sexy as they are, they're full in terms of trying to get business done there. Um, there's people doing everything there already, just like New York, just like Tokyo, just like all the major city centers in the world. And they need to start looking out to the second tier and the third tier cities. Um, you know, there's 400 million plus sports fans in China and it's growing because of all the efforts being put in by the government and all the, everybody here to make it grow. But out of that, 82% of them are outside of the major first tier cities, right? So the, the real market isn't in in those uh, those first year cities, they're where I'm at. Not even here, where I'm at in Shenzhen. They're out in the Chengdu's and the Qingdao's and the Wuhan's and the Xi'an's and all these cities that people in America probably have never heard of, but have composed majority of the population and hold what is it? Something like uh, looking here, it looks like 
say it's 90% of the household income is out in those second and third tier cities. So people can build a really good business just in Shenzhen or just in Shanghai or just in Beijing because they're big markets. But if you really want to succeed and, 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 and tap into where the opportunities are in China right now, it's in those second and third tier cities. Um, so that's something I'm really trying to push out and, and help people understand that they shouldn't just be looking at the easy, well-known markets or more developed markets, but willing to take the risk and get into, get into the, the sticks of China. Um, if they have a good strategy and they know they have a good product and they understand the government, then, then it's time to get in there and do it. Um, and then also, I think, uh, you know, just a little bit understanding how to better manage your people in, in China. Um, when, this is something that I've seen growing up. I started here when I was 24 years old, just out of university. And I've built a, my whole career here, and I've seen the way that generally Chinese management works. Um, and I think I've got some insight on how you can get better results from your team members than, than you would normally find in most Chinese managers. Um, so trying to help Chinese organizations understand how to get better results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so the Chinese government, I mean, not Chinese government, now we're talking about businesses. So, um, say for example, example, standard Chinese, that's interesting. I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> standard that Chinese that business, um, there's a manager and he'll sit in his office or he'll sit in the meeting room and he'll have the biggest chair and he'll, uh, he'll <laughs> set out the rules and the, and the plan and the dictate what everybody's <laughs> going to do for the day and then send them off to get it done. And it's really a top down organization in a lot of situations. Um, and there's not a lot of empathy or like you said, like you said before, empathy and the importance of it. It's not a lot of empathy in, in terms of getting jobs done and stuff. Um, and there's not a lot of freedom for people to express themselves and really, uh, show what they can do. Um, especially I think in sports, uh, because in sports here, there's, it's very closely aligned with the government. And so there's a lot of government influence in the way businesses are run, but by, but by being able to, uh, bring in some of those more Western concepts, um, while keeping in mind that you are dealing with Chinese people, they do need to have that strong leader. Um, but also giving them some opportunities to, to take on some real responsibility themselves and, and do it themselves without having to check with you on every little detail and every little point, those kinds of things can, can really empower an organization and help to help let it grow faster. Um, so that's something I'm trying to do more on the Chinese side than on the Western side. No, that's great. I mean, uh, mm. this is probably something I don't talk about very regularly on here is that I have one of the most, okay. I think for a few years, I was the most widely read project management writer in the world yeah. because I've had this PMI column for seven years now. Yeah. Or eight, seven or eight years. But that, th th these are all just bringing best practices of project management to the world because yeah. if you give people a little more freedom and a little, you know, you still set Strong, you know, still be a strong leader, um, but empathy and self-expression really unleash the potential um, of your organization. You know, I think that and these like are the biggest things the that you know that I how to how to relate um, with the government. Any other big that's the biggest thing I'm trying to push right now. With, with how to how to use what like, they're uh, doing to help you get better results. Um, it, you know, and, and you, you earlier on you said partner with the Chinese government, but I don't think that's what a Western organization should try and do, or they could do. It's more about just aligning yourself with them and trying to make sure that the story you're telling, when troubles come up, you can really point to it and say, look, this is the policy of the central government. This is the policy I or this is the strategy I have. This is how I'm trying to support it. Um, I think that those are the biggest things that uh, I'm really trying to push out. Hmm. Awesome. Now, all right. So, so we have like, I'm going to give you the top down, like takeaways from this thing before I ha ask you how to people can find you. So we want to use user messaging to, you know, make it a consistent a structured message. So unite the message was one thing. Mm -hmm. um, focus on how you can be a partner or not a partner, but just support the efforts of the Chinese government in local sports and grassroots sports to show that you're not yep. just there for a money grab. Um, <laughs> look outside of the major markets. So go, go into the second and third tier 
of cities because they have 82% of the population and about 90% of the household income. I even pay attention on this thing, man. This is, look at me, man. Uh, and then like, you know, helping the Chinese people understand how to um, use some of those Western management type ideas to help unleash a little bit more of the potential of their organizations. And, um, and I'm sure that probably one of the challenges that you're dealing with is a lot of times these Western management t- um, concepts, they get a little bit couched in like fuzzy, like hippy dippy language. And that probably turns off people a little bit, but it's really just giving people. Exactly. Freedom that's, of that's, that's to, just it. Exactly. You know, and giving these, job, giving, like giving these people expert, the opportunity to understand they have that you potential have skills, because they're coming I'm from a, a school manager, system where it's memorization and stuff. repetitive and, and they don't have a lot of personal expression and even going through school. And then suddenly they have a career and maybe their first job is in a very structured Chinese organization or they're coming straight out of university where they're still their teachers are the ones telling them every single detail they need to know. And how do you how do you help them and how do you encourage them to find the find the confidence to express themselves? That's a big part of, uh, I think, getting a successful organization here, um, because on the other side of it, there's also the risk that. Uh, the Chinese are very entrepreneurial. If you give them too much, too much, uh, space on your organization, they might just take your ideas, learn how to do it, and then go out and set up their own company and make it run with that. And that's happened more times than I can count in, in my time here. Um, so how do you balance those two challenges is, is I think a big challenge, is a big, a big, uh, factor to success here. And then the final one would be understanding. Yeah, yeah they're not the stupid. Right they know you're what you're here for. You know you're coming to, you come to China for right, a reason. Which is like but they want so to make sure that while you're here, because that can you're helping them get what they want. The right position, but aligning with the goals of the government. Yeah. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> I'm transparent. I just I, I I like to create value so I can collect a little exactly. bit of it. <laughs> um, well, I'm, but I'm, I'm happy to help I mean, you I'm achieve China, your goals. So most of those social media channels you get most of your guests to talk to about, I don't have, have access to very often. So LinkedIn is the best one. Um, Greg, Greg, how do we find I you on the internet? It's Greg Allen Turner. You can find me at LinkedIn. Um, also, great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not surprised. I'll tag at all. you in this on the thing. So that um, and then I've got my own email. website. I'm just kind of working on it right now. Right now, I'm trying to find you on Skype, there, but it's gregturner.net. <laughs> um, hopefully, in the next few weeks, I'll have some least. real content on there. <laughs> what did you think of my conversation with Greg Turner? Let me know by sending me an email. It is my name, Dave, at DaveWakeman.com. Also, you can check out my website. That's DaveWakeman.com where you'll find my blog. You'll find client lists. You'll find results, all kinds of great stuff. Um, Right right now, I'm putting up some stuff around predictions for 2020, um, thoughts on discounts from people I know all over the industry and around the world, uh, thoughts on customer service. All kinds of great stuff is going up there now. So check DaveWakeman.com. I'd love it if you'd connect with me on the social media. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at DavidWakeman. Despite what we heard about the Twitter purge of people who weren't using their names in their accounts, they put a pause on that, and I did not get the at Dave Wakeman Twitter handle, so I'm still at David Wakeman. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Just search for my name, Dave Wakeman, and I should come up. That big mug, you can't miss it. Uh, if you like what I'm doing with the podcast, I would tell you to definitely go to DaveWakeman.com and click on the link for Talking Tickets. It is a new newsletter that my team puts together with five top stories from the week along with a quick analysis so you can understand the story a little bit better and maybe take advantage of it so you can you know, make, turn it into an opportunity for you and your organization. So get that by visiting DaveWakeman.com and look for the Talking Tickets tab. Click that and it'll take you to where you need to go. As always, if you like what I'm doing on the podcast, I'd love it if you'd share an episode with a colleague or a friend. I think that this one with Greg Turner is going to be one that you're going to definitely want to share with folks. Um, but share any of them, like the one I just had with uh, Danny Frank, uh, any of the episodes I've had with Sam Sherman or Eric Fuller, um, Cat Spencer, Simon Mab, all of them. They're all add value. They all hopefully can give you something that you can use in your organization. If you've been sharing the podcast first, thank you. 
It's the holiday season. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. But I'd love it if you do something else. Maybe you want to become a subscriber. You can get us pretty much everywhere these days. And if you've subscribed, maybe you want to leave a review. It helps, number one, make sure people can find us. Number two, it encourages guests to come on the business of fun. And number three, it feels good to me. And it makes sure that I continue to do this thing. Um, So it's great. Finally, I want to thank my friends at Booking Protect who have been tremendous partners over the years of me, the Business of Fun podcast, the Talking Tickets newsletter, and all those things that we do. They are great partners to the ticket industry. If you don't know them, you should check them out at BookingProtect.com. We are going to be together at Intix in New York City on the 20th to 23rd of January where you'll be able to find me. You'll be able to find Kat Spencer. You'll be able to find Simon Mab. Um, Simon's got a game plan. I don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be great. Um, we'll probably have the famous white couch so people have some place to sit. Make sure you check us out. If you're going to be at Intix, send me an email, dave at davewakeman.com. Let me know you're going to be there so we can catch up. It's going to be great. But make sure you check out bookingprotect.com and find out how you can partner with them to deliver a world-class customer service experience to your guests, how you can create a new stream of revenue for your organization, and how you can take advantage of giving people a better, more customized buying experience, which is very, very important to today's consumer, especially considering how far in advance tickets go on sale. So do that. Check out bookingprotect.com. Keep an eye on the blog because we've been putting up some really, really great stuff follow them on LinkedIn. Um, There's a new person in charge of social media at Booking Protect, and she's fantastic. Uh, She's getting like really great interviews up, really great stories on social media. She's doing a lot of really, really, really cool stuff. Um, So make sure you check out the Booking Protect blog, the Booking Protect website, and follow Booking Protect on LinkedIn. All right. So until next time, if I don't talk to you before the holiday, happy holidays, no matter which one you celebrate or which of them, if you celebrate them all, enjoy. If you only celebrate one or two of them, enjoy. Um, But thank you for being here and thank you for listening. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care.